<laughs> Joining us at the stage, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the American astrophysicist and writer. Mr. Tyson, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, we uh, are and an emotional, we are an emotional you. people, uh, you know, we Indians, and we get, uh, we get a bit emotional, sometimes too emotional. But it is, an, it is a big moment, you know, it's a moment of pride to see one of our countrymen up at the International Space Station. It's taken far too long. You know about our space ambitions. So could you reflect on what this means for a country with a developing space program? Yeah, I can tell you without hesitation that an astronaut representing a country upon returning to the country is a hero. Let's just put it out there. They're a hero. People will line up to take photos with them. And it's uh, the way I, I, I joke about it where, and I say, no one has ever given a parade for a robot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we do it for people. When one of our own is in, uh, does something uh, heroic, does, is on an adventure and comes back to talk about it, that's, that's important. And uh, so, Another way to think about this, we should all look forward to the day where this is no longer interesting because it's happening so often. And when you reach that point, then you can truly declare yourselves to be a spacefaring nation where it's just, oh, what's good? Oh, I got another mission going up this week. Cool. We'll, we'll find out when they get back, you know, what they've been up to. And I, I want to say something quick about these images we've been seeing. Yep. I just want to remind you. Everyone in that scene is weightless. Yep. So they could have had fun and had one of them completely upside down, alternating, and they would feel no different. <laughs> so they all lined up just for the camera. I just want you to know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There is no up or down when you are weightless in orbit uh, around the Earth. You know, I think it's... Uh People around the world would have seen images and videos like this for so many years, and the quality of the video just keeps getting better. But I think, uh, Mr. Tyson, the point which I'd like you to reflect on is the fact that there's nothing ordinary or easy or simple about human beings being in space, right? It's, it is incredibly difficult. It was in the 60s, and it is now. Yeah, so I, I cannot overstate the fact that at the end of the day, yes, it is rocket science. And the number of scientists and engineers and uh, administrators and, and way back in there, the funding streams, all of this has to work. And when it doesn't work, it puts lives at risk. And so uh, fortunately, we've had many steps tested and retested and retested, which has reduced the risk, but the risk is not zero. And astronauts have died, uh, not only on the launch pad, but in space. And so, we, yes, we should never take any of this for granted. And there's, a, uh, there's the saying that we say in the United States, maybe other countries say it too, we say Godspeed yep. to the astronauts. And, uh, you know, the very word goodbye came from a time that, that's a contraction of God be with you mm -hmm. when you left the city walls. And it was very dangerous moving between the cities. So you, you look for divine protection where it was most dangerous. Well, when jo our first astronaut, John Glenn, yeah. was in space yeah. in 1962, the headline was Godspeed John Glenn. A dangerous thing to be traveling that fast on an adventure hardly tested uh, by anyone. And so... Uh, yes, this emotion is still with us when we see our, our astronaut heroes uh, take these voyages. Uh, Dr. Neil, this is Palav Bagla from the NDTV office. Uh, welcome to the broadcast. Uh, there were many Godspeed moments for this mission. While they were still on the ground, there were several delays. And when astronaut Peggy Whitson came into the International Space Station, she spoke about the long quarantine. Uh, we had several issues, and then as the mission was lifting up, we also had two anxious moments with the fiber in the, in the hatch, and then the wind uh, file not uploading. Uh, what do you have to say for that? These were very anxious moments for this particular mission, and a 30-day quarantine? Is that the longest you ever heard of? <laughs> Maybe. 
Uh, but, I mean, they're all professional. Remember that. So, and I'd rather, I'd rather, you know, delay the mission than take the risk of not having it ever succeed. So we can be frustrated. Watch the delay. Wait, fix the delay. No, take your time fixing the delay. Because I don't, I, don't, I don't want to raise the risk of harm that is already inherent in the entire operation. So, yes, I think uh, you were very close to this mission and every little step. Every mission has little things that go wrong. Fortunately, much of the system, and thanks to engineers, have redundancies built in. So that if something goes wrong, there's a backup. Or if this goes wrong, we'll do without that uh, for now, and maybe for the rest of the mission, we'll just compensate in other ways. So well-designed risky missions will always have these backup scenarios, uh, always in the interest of protecting human life. Uh, Dr. Neep, in November we complete 25 years of continuous human presence at the International Space Station. How exciting is that? And one, one more follow-up question for you. In 25 years, we've invested billions of dollars of uh, uh, taxpayer money on the International Space Station, which is one, two, or three blockbuster research which has emerged from the space station. Well, so I think the way you need to think about it, well, of the, of the many ways to think about this, for me, the most important is is not listing the achievements or the scientific research and the results that come from it. You could do that. But I think there's, there are other forces operating. For example, the, just the national pride of each country that has an astronaut represented on the space station. If I, if I, underst if I read correctly, uh, uh, each of the, the, the Polish astronaut, the Hungarian astronaut, and, of course, the Indian astronaut is their first time to the space station. And this will be, this is very important in the countries for which they are represented. And what I'm getting at is you know that space exploration and launches and landings and space stations requires fluency in science, technology, engineering, and math, the STEM fields. Well, if you're a kid wanting to know what should I do when I grow up and you see this happening in space, it, has a, it is a force of inspiration that rivals a force of nature unto itself. Driving interest in the STEM fields. And the STEM fields are the engines of the future growth economies of the world. So an impact can be measured by other ways beyond just a checklist of activities that have been conducted. You can try to measure the force it has on a culture and on civilization. And I'll tell you this as well, that it's the science, it's the STEM fields that stand the greatest chance of lifting a nation out of poverty because this is where economies are born. This is where high tech industries, quality jobs arrive. And so, uh, so yeah, I, when I think of space, I see it as a force of inspiration, not as a checklist to see what did you accomplish today. Dr. Neil, India has a program going up to 2040 for which the government has invested a huge amount of money, which is to land an Indian on the moon by 2040. So the, 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 the roadmap is quite clear for India. Uh, for you, sitting from your perch, that India will soon have its own human space program, an Indian space station, and land an Indian on the moon, and be a developed country by 2047. Uh, does that uh, uh, sound good and exciting to you? you uh, it's always good to have the goals. Uh, you know, when President Kennedy said, we will land a man on the moon before the decade is out, uh, we felt that, that, you know, we said, we don't want to make a liar out of him. Let's go ahead and do this. Uh, and by the way, I want to add to what you said. So it's not just an Indian space station and an Indian landing on the moon. Uh, you hinted at it, but I want to drive home. Part of that goal is that it's completely top to bottom Indian produced technologies. Uh, and so it's no longer 
a, a commercial venture from another country. It wouldn't be SpaceX or NASA. So you'd be doing it on your own, and that is another source of pride that I know we had when we were going into space, we, the United States. So, uh, so I, I, I wish uh, India well. Uh, I wish them luck. Sometimes you need a little bit of luck as well. Uh, but it's less luck and more brilliance in the scientists and engineers that are attempting to make that happen. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, wonderful speaking to you, and uh, I, I agree entirely. Um, you know, it is Indian engineering at the end of the day, which uh, really has to come of age. In many senses, it has. But as you push the boundaries even further, there's a lot more to achieve. And I think we're really making a lot of progress there. I'm now joined by... Yeah, Dr. and by the way, if I just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I go, go right add, ahead. Go right ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when uh, India landed on the moon yeah. with, the, with the rover, yeah. and the headlines were, India becomes the fourth country to land on the moon. And I thought to myself... That's not the headline. You know what the headline was? India becomes the first country to land at the moon's south pole. That's, we, we think there are reservoirs of water frozen in the bottoms of craters where the sunlight never reaches, because it's near the pole, the sun doesn't get very high in the sky, and so it's always shadowed from the crater rim. And so any water that fell there from comets has stayed there for billions of years. The future of colonies on the moon is going, to, is going to be the South Pole. And to the extent that India targets that, they could lead the world, not just be a country that lands there, they might just lead the world in what kind of innovative exploration would be conducted there.